Your eye is one of the most incredibly made parts of your body. I'm currently filming this with a digital camera that has a lens attached. Even the most amazing man-made camera in the world can't come close to what the eye does. It's a system that allows you to see light, to see different colors, different wavelengths of light. It allows you to focus on things that are infinitely far away and then to things that are a few centimeters away in a millisecond. It allows you to track motion without you even having to think about it. It's incredible. So let's have a look at how it works. By the way, if you don't know anything about lenses yet, then have a look at my lenses video first. I put it in the astrophysics playlist, but it does apply to the eye. Link is in the description. So as with a normal lens, we have this line that we call the principal axis. Now the first thing that light meets, the bit at the front of the eye, obviously. This is the cornea. And it's basically a big, powerful lens that takes all the light from every direction and makes sure that it funnels it through the eye. And so it's the thing that does most of the focusing. Now this is similar to cameras. On a camera, you'll have a lens on the very front that light goes into, and that doesn't change. But that's the thing that makes sure that it gets as much light as possible traveling down the lens. Same thing with the cornea. Now a camera has an aperture as well. That's the bladed thing that lets more or less light through. Again, we have something similar and even better. This is the iris. And that's obviously the bit that has color in your eye. And the hole we say is the pupil. So the iris can open and close to make the pupil bigger or smaller to let less or more light in, depending on how much light there is. Once it goes through there, then it gets to the actual lens. Now this is a lens, it does fine focusing. That's to make sure that the light all meets at the back of your eyeball. That's where we have the retina. Now the retina fills quite a big part of the back of your eyeball. And what goes on there is incredible, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But what it does is that it just takes signals down the optic nerve to your brain where they can then be interpreted, made into images that you can see, which is incredible in itself. Now, because we're only concerned with whether light is focused on the back of the eyeball at the retina or not, we're not concerned with the individual parts, really. We're talking about the eye as a whole. So we just model the eyeball as one lens. But you might remember that the total power of a lens is equal to just the power of one part of the lens plus the power of the second part of the lens. So actually we can just take the power of the cornea and add it to the power of the lens and we can end up with the total power of the eyeball. If you remember, power is given by one over the focal length. Now the focal length is the distance from the lens to the principal focus point, which hopefully is at the retina. This distance here is roughly 1.7 centimeters. So if we do one divided by 0 0.017, that gives us a power of about 59 and that's measured in diopter. But naturally you won't be focusing on something that's the same distance away the whole time. So this power needs to change. And what changes? It's the lens here that changes, not the cornea. This is the amazing thing for a single lens in a camera, that's a single piece of glass, you can't change the focal length. That's only done by moving the pieces of glass around inside of the whole lens. The amazing thing about the eye is that this doesn't move back and forth at all. What happens in your eye is that your muscles change the shape of the lens in order to change its power. It really is genius. Incidentally, how would the shape of the lens have to change if you wanna make it more powerful? Well, more powerful lenses are fatter, so it would look like this. That's what happens. I'll get onto more of that in a minute. So if you've seen a camera with a proper lens, you can actually see the infinity symbol on it. That means that your lens is focusing on something that's infinitely far away. So I'm just gonna model the eye as a sphere now. We know that the lens is in there. But what happens is that the light rays come from an object that's infinitely far away, parallel to the principal axis. And we want them to meet all on the retina like that. Now infinity is the furthest thing that we could ever possibly focus on. So that means that that is when our lens is a low power, and that means that the lens in the eye is thin, so it'll look like that. We call this mode, as it were, 
unaccommodated. We can almost think of that as being the default mode of the eye. Let's put it this way. When you're daydreaming, you stare off into the distance. And that's because you're not thinking about where you're looking. And so your eyes default to focusing on something infinitely far away. However, when you want to focus on something that's not infinitely far away, let's say that it's a football, the light is spreading out from the ball, isn't it? And so it's spreading out as it goes into your eye, but we still need it to all meet at the same point on the retina. The lens can't stay the same shape. If it did stay the same shape, then the lens wouldn't be powerful enough. So that means that these light rays would be focusing behind the retina. That means you're gonna get a fuzzy image. That's not what you want. So what happens, like we said, the lens changes shape to be fatter, to be more powerful, and it decreases the focal length. That's a high power, the fat, and we say that's accommodated. We're accommodating for the fact that light is not coming from infinitely far away. It's not coming into your eyeball parallel. Now, because the eye is so finely tuned, things can go wrong fairly easily if something's not quite right. And that can lead to short-sightedness and long-sightedness. Now, the proper name for short-sightedness is myopia. You might hear someone say that their sight is myopic. And long-sighted, the proper name is hypermetropia. Sounds like a muse song, if you ask me. So what does this mean in reality? If you're short-sighted, that means that you can see things that are right in front of you, but you can't focus on distant objects. Of course, it's the other way around. For hypermetropia, you cannot focus on near objects. Now, there's a couple of causes for this. If you're short-sighted, that's because the cornea or the lens are too powerful or eyeball is too long. If you're long-sighted, it's the other way around. Two sides of the same coin, really, if you think about it. If your eyeball is too short, then that means that your lens needs to be more powerful in order to focus the light at a shorter focal length. So let's have a look what's going on with the light rays then. So if you're short-sighted and the object's fairly far away here, that means that your eyeball is focusing, but they're focusing at this point here. And as you can see, that is not at the back of the eyeball. That's not at the retina. So you won't see a clear image. Your image will be fuzzy. With long sightedness, light goes in and instead of meeting at the retina, they meet here. So that means again, that the light is not converging. The rays aren't converging, meeting at the retina. So therefore, Again, you're gonna get a fuzzy image. So how do you fix that? Well, you fix it with glasses, don't you? So with short sightedness, you need to make sure that the light rays are not converging so quickly. So you need to make them diverge before they get into your eye. And that's what we do. We have a lens that is concave. Now the light rays come in and they're diverged more before going into your eye. And then that means that hopefully they'll meet at the retina. Don't forget that if a lens is concave, a diverging lens, that means that the power is going to be negative. And also it's good to remember that a diverging lens will not create a real image by itself. It can only create a virtual image. You can't project an image from a concave lens. Convex lens, like your cornea and your lens in your eye, they project a real image onto the back of your eyeball. So fairly obvious, it's gonna be opposite for long sightedness, light comes in. We need to make sure that it converges more before it comes into your eyeball. So send it that way. And then hopefully again, it'll meet at the retina. And we have a positive power here, don't we? Don't forget that if you want to find the total power of your glasses and your eyeball, you can just add them up. Now, one last little thing on this, astigmatism. It's what happens when your eye works maybe better vertically than horizontally or vice versa. So if you have short sightedness or long sightedness, then you'll usually have a lens that is just circular. It's the same no matter which way you turn it around. However, if you have an astigmatism, then you need to have a cylindrical lens. Let's say that your vision vertically is fine, but horizontally it's not great. That means that in your glasses, you want a lens that sort of looks like this. This lens will not refract light vertically, but only horizontally. If it's the other way around, you just need to spin the lens 90 degrees. 
You have a couple of terms that you need to know, and they are far point and near point. Far point is the max distance you can focus on, and near point, the minimum distance you can focus on. Let's say you want to correct short sight. The far point should be infinity, shouldn't it? So you should be able to have lines coming in from infinity and meeting at your retina, but that doesn't happen. Let's say that somebody's far point is this far. That's the furthest that they can focus on. You need a lens that diverges the light. Now we know that a concave lens has a quote unquote virtual image, which is actually behind. It's not really there. It's just, if we take the lines that go out from it, they meet here. And so that's what we want our lens to do. We want it to have this focal length that is equal to the far point. Now this focal length is gonna be negative because it's behind the lens. So therefore the power is going to be negative too. Let's say that somebody's far point is only 10 meters, let's say. That means that the power of this lens is going to be one over minus 10. That gives us minus 0 0.1 diopter. What if you're correcting for long sightedness though? This one's a little bit more complicated because, well, because everybody's far point should be infinity, shouldn't it? They should be able to focus on that. However, let's say that you're correcting for long sight. You need to focus on something. Well, maybe that's a meter in front of you, half a meter in front of you. These are what reading glasses are for, e.g. reading glasses. And for this, we're going to need the lens equation. So one over F, that's one over the focal length, is equal to one over U, that's the object distance, plus one over V, the image distance. If you don't know what this means, have a look at my lenses video. The object distance, well, if we're talking about reading glasses, then let's go for the book distance. That's gonna be positive. And the image distance in this case is going to be person's near point. Now, this is gonna be negative. Now, it's a little bit complicated as to why this is negative, but ultimately, it's because it isn't really an image distance, it's the near point. And so we're talking about a distance that is the wrong side of the lens. So that's why it's negative. And of course, we know that power of the convex lens needed is gonna be equal to one over that number. So actually, it's just gonna be equal to one over the distance that you want the near point to be at, let's say about 20 centimeters, something like that. If you're a young person, your near distance is probably gonna be about 10 centimeters, but for an old person, you know, 20 centimeters is okay. Person's near point, that's what it is before being corrected, and that is going to be negative. And you'll end up with a power of, let's say, one to 10 diopter in order to fix your long sightedness. Okay, so that's all the lens stuff out of the way. So let's have a look at the retina, shall we? So if this is your eyeball here, if you look at the back of your eyeball with one of those light magnifying glass thingies, you'll see uh, some nerves there and you'll see some yellow stuff as well. So let's have a think about what all those different things are. Now you probably know that the retina is made of cells that are sensitive to light. So I'm just gonna draw these much, much larger than they actually are. The first one that we're going to look at is rods. That's a bad drawing. And we have lots of these. Now rods are used in low light situations and they don't do color. So there's only one type of rod. But then we have cones, look somewhat similar, but they have a bit more of a cone shape. And we have three types of those. Ones that are sensitive to green wavelengths, ones that are sensitive to red wavelengths of light, and no prices for guessing, ones that are sensitive to blue wavelengths of light. Now they don't actually look that color, if you think about it, they'll be the opposite. But I've just drawn it that way to make it clear that they are sensitive to different wavelengths. Obviously, these are responsible for us being able to see color. And there are lots in the part of the retina that we call the yellow vervea. I haven't really drawn it too well, but you'll find them more in the center. You'll find more rods and less cones the further away from the center of the retina you go. Now you might not know this next bit, and this is the bit that really gets me, is that the actual nerves that carry the information are in front of the cones and the rods. And so these then take information to the optic nerve, and then that goes off to your brain to be interpreted. So we can say that rods and cones are photoreceptors. They are sensitive to light. 
Now we need light to be absorbed by these cells, don't we? So they need to have a color themselves. So they contain a pigment, different pigments, that bleach. In other words, they lose their color when light falls onto them. This then sends a signal down the nerves. Now they can't stay bleached forever because otherwise that means that light isn't gonna be absorbed by them. So these cells are unbleached, reset as it were, ready for the next bit of light by vitamin A and you get that from the blood. And so that's why if you look through the eye, you'll not only see nerves in the retina, but you'll see some little blood vessels going all the way across your retina as well. So you're looking at a screen right now and that screen is made up of pixels and each pixel has three mini pixels as it were. One that's producing blue light, one that's producing red light and one that's producing green light. That's because those are emitting the wavelengths that these cones in your retina can absorb. The cones are less sensitive to blue light, to blue wavelengths. What for what, jewel for jewel, your eyes are most sensitive to green light. So we can say they're most sensitive to green and actually because yellow is predominantly green wavelengths as it were, we can say yellow as well. And why are they most sensitive to these? Because of higher absorption of these wavelength photons. And as you know, we're talking about the order of hundreds of nanometers, blue and violet being around 300, 350, 400 nanometers, and then going up to red at about 600 to 700 nanometers. Now, I remember back in the day when we had our first computer, it had four megabytes of RAM and it had a hard drive that was 800 megabytes. The screen, the monitor, it only had a resolution of something like 800 by 600 pixels. And then they brought out, they called it HD Ready, but that was 1280 by 720. And then proper HD, full HD as they call it, is 1920 by 1080 pixels. And now everybody nowadays is talking about 4K and 8K as well. So it begs the question, at what point are you unable to see individual pixels anymore? And I remember asking that question when I was a wee lad as well. Now, Apple being the marketing geniuses that they are, they wanted to make a display for their iPads and their phones that was called the Retina Display. And the idea was that the pixels were gonna be so small, so tightly packed together, that your eye could not distinguish between one pixel and the next. Basically, it's the maximum resolution that your eye could see. And we call this spatial resolution. Now we are getting into a little bit of brain weirdness because no one really knows how these signals are interpreted by the brain. But we do know that you have the maximum resolution, as it were, at the yellow spot, the yellow fovea, where the spot is. And that's because the cones are densely packed at that point. There's lots of them. And also, they all have their own nerve. Whereas further from the spot, less densely packed, and they share nerves as well. So we have lower spatial resolution. Let's say that you have a fence that's just a bunch of vertical lines like that. Further away you get, the less you are able to distinguish between these lines. If you get far enough away, it means that this image is now so small on your retina that you don't have a cone picking up a slat and then a gap and then a slat and then a gap. Basically, you have the light coming from, let's say, two of these slats, all meeting one cone, and so that means that you can't see the gap in between. You just see an average, as it were. That's how it works with digital cameras as well. As you can see, there is a heck of a lot packed into such a small package that is your eyeball. It really is an amazing piece of tech. Don't take it for granted. So I hope that helped. If you think that I've missed anything, or you have any questions, put them in a comment down below, and I'll see you next time.